Hello and welcome. Do you have a pet? Do you bird watch? Or like me, do you just sometimes gaze out the window and watch the rabbits and deer eat the latest thing you planted in the garden and try to decide whether to laugh or cry? Regardless, we all have relations with the animals in the world around us. And today we're excited to explore that world a little more deeply. I'm Alan Briggs. I'm an AARP North Carolina volunteer in the mountain region. And our mission is to empower people as they age, to be a supportive friend. And we know that research has pointed out that pets and other interaction with animals can really help us all enjoy life, reduce stress, provide a sense of purpose and social interaction that's important for each of us in our mental and physical health. This virtual series that we're starting today is focusing on those animal-human bonds and how those relationships can reinforce the good health and strengthening and expanding our social networks. So as we plan this series, we have several upcoming segments that you'll see later. Today is our first, so for the next three Thursdays at noon, look at our link and consider joining us for future programs. Today's format is really designed to be more of a presentation, but we do encourage you to offer comments and ask questions as we go along, and we'll try to acknowledge those. If you're on Facebook, you can find your comment section at the bottom of the page, and if you're on YouTube, you'll find it on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll do our best, as I say, to answer or respond to those questions as we go along. Today, I'm really humbled and honored to kick this off by exploring these ways that culture can affect the way we interact with the animal world around us. And what better source for that than a culture that for 15,000 plus years has embraced, cultivated, and nurtured relationships with the natural and animal world around us. A culture where humans don't necessarily rule or have dominion over animals, plants, and the earth, but rather coexist in a natural way with all of creation. So today, please welcome me in uh, welcoming two very, very special elders and renowned storytellers from the Eastern Band of Cherokee. We have with us today, Freeman Owl and Kathy Littlejohn. Welcome, Osio. Osio, thank you. Osio. Um, these bios for these folks are so impressive. They're like the lyrics to a Johnny Cash song. They've been everywhere, man. Uh, <laughs> women started out uh, born on the, res on the Kuala Boundary and attended BIA schools there through his elementary and high school years. Went to college at Gardner Webb in Western Carolina, ultimately getting a master's in education. And at the same time, he became dedicated to returning back to the boundary to share his knowledge acquired in the outside world, but also to share the history, culture, language of the tribe. And he still teaches elementary school at the BIA school on the boundary. And I don't know if I can honestly do justice to the list of awards and places he's been, but he has been traveling all over as a featured storyteller. He's received an award, the Presidential uh, Preserve America Award, the uh, North Carolina Folklorist of the Year one year and has been recognized. He's also gone back to a number of military bases and traveled around sharing these stories. And he brings that unique perspective to uh, his stories by having lived, raised, and now is aging in place on the Kuala Boundary. And similarly, Kathy Littlejohn, she started out listening to stories, as I understand it, as a child and then later working at the historical village at Conalupti and listening to storytellers there. And like a lot of us, then she wanted to go off into the world and that went to the West Coast and spent some time in Seattle. And it kind of brought her home. She was studying uh, education there as well and was hearing storytellers locally and had occasion to recite a story from one of the Northwest tribes. And it reminded her of her experiences as a child and the stories she'd learned back home. And so she too has returned to Kuala Boundary. Since then, she has performed all over as well. We were talking earlier about uh, she 
was part of the Eclipse program that NASA sponsored during the Eclipse a few years ago in the Great Smoky Mountains. Yeah. The Cherokee have stories about the Eclipse going back for centuries. They knew how to deal with an Eclipse and observed it and yeah. observed that uh, response for many years. She's been to Colonial Williamsburg, Mountain Heritage Festival, uh, list goes on and on. All I can say is we're really fortunate to have two very, very special people with us today. And I will, without further ado, they've decided to tag team here. So what we'll do is start off with a story from Freeman and then a story from Kathy. And then we'll pause to see if there are comments or questions. And if not, we'll just continue kind of a tag team. Uh, they're used to doing this together. They've performed together many times. So with that, I will defer now to Freeman. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really, I'm really glad, glad to be here today. Sure. And, um, thank you so very much. Um, I want to tell you a story today about the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. And, and in those old days, it was all the uh, bands were together. And they lived here for 15,000 years or more. But in the beginning, they say that the Great Spirit made the heavens and the earth. And the earth was covered with water. And so they wanted to put people down upon the earth. And so the Great Spirit began to try to figure out a way that he would know when the land was dry and ready for humans. And so he began to take a few of the birds out of the heavens and send them down to fly across the earth. And for many, many days, he uh, let them fly. And many of them began to get very tired after a while. And um, he was running out of birds and did not know quite what to do. And so there was at one time only one big old bird left, and his name was Egwashuli. And that means giant buzzard in Cherokee. And um, so he asked the buzzard, said, uh, can you help us check out the earth and uh, see if um, it's ready for humans? And so the old buzzard said, yeah, I think I can fly as long as you want me to. And so he began to sail and get on the air currents and go higher and higher into the heavens. And he went down and began to sail around the earth. And he sailed for many, many days. And eventually, after a while, he began to get tired. And he too was about ready to crash into the, the soft mud. And so he started flapping his giant wings. When he flapped those giant wings and they went down into the soft mud, they made the valleys. When they came back up again, they made the mountains. And so they called him back and said something to the effect of Kena Egwashuli Ulista. And so that means get back up here, hurry. We don't want you to make the whole world into mountains. So they brought him back into the heavens. And if you look out across the land where the Cherokee people live, they say this is where the giant vulture flew. And once the people were put down upon the earth, they were living in caves and um, trying to keep warm during the cold winters in the, uh, this part of the world. And, and so that was not quite enough. And they were trying to figure out if they were going to be able to make it or not. And eventually there was a boat of lightning that came down out of the heavens. They struck a sycamore tree and that tree began to burn. And they called all of their friends and their relatives together for a council and all these animals and birds and insects and everything came together and they began to talk and try to figure out a way to get that fire from that burning tree. And so first of all, they decided we will send this screech owl over to uh, fly over to the stump and bring an ember of fire back to us. And so the screech owl agreed to that. He flew over to the burning stump and dived deep inside it. And before he could get out of there, it burned smudge marks all around his eyes. And he also had um, very little daytime vision. And so the screech owl said, that is so dangerous. I'm not going to mess with that anymore. Fire is too dangerous to have around. And so they met again and decided that they were going to send the crow and the raven. So the crow and the raven decided that, yes, we'll go try, give it a try, and so we can bring the fire back. And so the old crow went over, and it turned in jet black very quickly, and he's still black today. And the same thing happened to the raven, and they decided they would not go back again because that was deadly. It was dangerous. And so the people and the animals were still meeting and talking, and they decided to send uh, a little tiny water spider, even though she looked frail and small, and she had promised him that she could get that fire for them. And so sure enough, um, she went over and made a little pottery vessel, put it on her back. And she walked across the water with that pottery vessel upon her back. And she raked a little ember into it, 
and she came back across and she um, dumped it out in the grass and the wind began to blow and the fire began to burn. And so from that day forward, the Salagi Ani Omiya, the Cherokee, the principal people have had that fire. And you can only imagine what differences that the uh, fire had made uh, for the people themselves. At that point in time, they began to think about different things to entertain themselves like games and uh, better farming methods so that they could survive a lot better. And so it really brought the Cherokee society uh, much, much closer. And um, they were able to do many, many more things. So the animals have always been a very important part of Cherokee life. And the Cherokee people believe that everything living and non-living is sacred and that we should respect and take care of all of those things. Because if we lose one part of the whole puzzle, then it makes things different and not always in a good way. So uh, that's my story of creation scheme. Not, not only do we have the creation stories and uh, like Freeman's uh, wonderful story was that he shared, but we also see that our behavior has been uh, taught in the stories that if, if we are not respectful to the animals, um, then horrible things will happen to the whole group or to the whole family. And, but at the same time, some of the stories are funny and they explain um, how we should act as humans towards one another, as well as to the animals. And it, if you hear of other Native American stories or read of them, you'll see that, uh, for example, in the Southwest, there was a character um, that is the coyote, and in the north uh, west, it's the raven, and for the northeast and southeastern tribes, it's the rabbit. Now, uh, rabbit, rabbit was always in trouble, and he was always trying to get by the easiest way possible. Um, he would cheat, and he would try to trick the other animals and humans. So one day, Rabbit was out in the woods and he spied Fox coming his way. And he knew that Fox had been successfully fishing because he had a string of fish tied to his tail. Now Rabbit thought, mmm, I really want to eat some fish today. How can I get those fish from Fox? Oh, I know. He ran ahead and he laid down across the forest's path and pretended to be dead. And when the fox came around and looked at that rabbit, he thought, look at this, a freshly killed rabbit. Mm, but I better not. I have these fish. So he stepped over the rabbit and walked on. Well, rabbit jumped up, ran around in front of him and lay down on the other side of the path. Here comes Fox. Look at that. Two rabbits in one day. Uh, I better not. I've got all these fish. Stepped over rabbit and walked on. Well, rabbit jumped up and ran again in front and flopped down on the path and pretended to be dead. Here comes Fox. I can't believe it. I cannot believe my luck. Three, three rabbits. Um, I know, I'm gonna go hide my fish and then I'll go back and get the other two rabbits. So he goes over to this log and he puts the fish inside and he covers up the opening with leaves and dead branches and he goes back to get the other two rabbits. Well, as soon as Fox gets out of sight, Rabbit jumps up, grabs the fish and runs ahead and has a nice fish fry.
Thank you, both of you. Freeman, you want to take another round for us? Sure, I can. I'd like to tell you about um, an appreciation of uh, animals and all of those wonderful, beautiful things that the Creator has put here for us. You know, the uh, western part of the United States and the Midwest used to be filled with buffalo, beautiful herds of thousands of these bison. And all of a sudden, we uh, had none of them left. And they were just uh, sort of killed for no reason whatsoever. And um, even today, their uh, remains and bones are still stacked up and um, using being used for fertilizer out west. And so that shows what a great loss that we had because we as humans thought we were created to uh, go out and tame the wilderness and be uh, in control of everything. And uh, many times we thought that meant simple destruction of all of those things that were, were at hand. But um, in the early times, it, it said that the Cherokee people were out killing the animals. They would kill as many as they could and they would let leave them on the ground and just let them lay there to decay and uh, thought it was a whole lot of fun. And, and so once the uh, animals began to get very, very upset because they were being murdered and wasted for no reason whatsoever. And so the animals had a great council meeting and they decided to um, go out into the forest and to try to find things that would be bad for humans. They also tried to go in and get the weapons that were being used to kill them. And they were going to go into the villages and kill the humans, but they tried to bow an arrow. And uh, you, can you imagine the bear trying to shoot a bow with an arrow? And, um, and so it just wouldn't work for his claws. And he was breaking the string continually and they couldn't throw the spears and they used the blow guns. And, and so they sort of gave up on that and they went out into the woods to look for those diseases and they searched and knelt until they found the worst of them. And at night, while the people were asleep in their villages, they would walk through those villages and spread the diseases that they had brought. And so human beings were dying left and right very quickly and there's not much hope left at all until one day the great spirit felt sorry for humans that they were all going to die and be gone forever. And so he talked to the plant world and he asked the plant world to invent a cure so that they could deal with these diseases. And um, it said that um, every plant was able to produce a cure for a disease. And it said, if you know where to look out into the uh, forest and the fields and the riverbanks, you will find many, many plants that are used for diseases and that for every disease that existed at the time, there is a cure out there somewhere. And so uh, there was an old story that said that there was an old sick man that came to the villages of the Cherokee and there were seven clans and he would start out at one clan and he would go to the gate of the village. In those days, they had these big palisades that surrounded the village and there was only one entrance so that they could fight off the enemy if they were to attack the village. And so um, every village that he went to, he went to the bird clan, they turned him away and said, you're sick, you look terrible, go away. We have children in this village, stay away from our village. So he'd go to the blue clan and the paint clan and the wild potato clan, the deer clan. And so he would just got turned away. They said, no, we don't want you here. And so eventually he came to the last clan. It was like the wolf clan. And so he went in and the, the lady who was in charge of the wolf clan said, we don't know what to do for you, but you look terrible and we feel sorry for you. But if you would come on in the village, we will do everything we can to make you well. So he went into the village and they gave him a place to lay down. He lay down upon the bed and he said, go down by the river and get the bark of the wild willow, bring it back and make tea for me and let me drink. And when they did that, they prepared it just the way he told them and, and he began to feel a little better. And we know today that that wild willow has a form of natural aspirin in it. And the next day he would say, go down and get the spice bush. Do not use the berries, do not use the leaves, but use the twigs and break them up, put them in water and make tea and let me drink. 
And so they break that up, put it into the water, and he drank, and he felt a whole lot better and looked uh, a little less swollen and bloated. But you come to find out that that is a natural diuretic. And for every day, for a long, long time, he sent these people out to get the medicines, bring them back, and told them exactly how to prepare them. And so he says, from this day forward, when he was well completely and got up and got ready to leave the village, you people in this Cherokee tribe will be the keepers of the medicine. And from here on out, prepare them the way I've told you. That has been a gift for you for being nice. So I think that is a lesson to say that we need to be nice to one another, not only all the creations of the world, but we need to be nice to one another and respect what God has given us. Thank you. I want to tell this one. Um, there was once a bird that was born with enormous, gigantic feet. And this poor bird would try his best to be with the other birds and and fly as fast as they would and something would always happen. And he would stumble as he was trying to take off and he would roll over and do a somersault instead of fly like the other birds. And he felt very clumsy and he tried to hide his feet. And the other birds sometimes were very not nice and they would make fun of his big feet. He felt like he needed to move away, that he was just no use to anyone. So he moved way over on the other side of the field and lived there until one day a mother bird came flying through the field and she was crying at the top of her voice. Somebody help me, please help me. The Cherokee men are coming and they're coming to burn the field. And I have these eggs. I have four eggs and I can't move them fast enough. Please won't you help me? The other birds were busy trying to move their own eggs or trying to fly away and no one stopped to help her. Finally, someone shouted and said, hey, remember that bird with the big feet over in the corner? Go over and see if he'll help. So she flew over and she said, oh, please help me. I cannot move my eggs fast enough. They're coming. Won't you please help me? And he said, me? Uh, me? I can't. I, I, might, I, I, might, I might drop them. And she said, no, no, you're our only chance. Please come with me. So he flew back over with the mother bird and very carefully. He picked up one egg and then another and put both of the eggs on one foot. And then he picked up the third egg and then the fourth and he could balance them perfectly. He flew over far, far deep in the woods where the eggs would be safe and transferred them to a temporary nest for the mother bird. And all the birds thought that he was just such a hero. And he showed that it's just fine to be a little different. And everyone has wonderful talents that they can share. That's beautiful. And both of those stories are so instructive. Um, would you mind just taking a, a brief pause? I'm curious because you know, listening and learning about both of you and your background, you did uh, leave the boundary for education and further pursuits and decided to return, particularly as you grew older and, and learned more. You obviously chose to come back and share this uh, your experiences, but also it sounds like dig a little deeper into your own uh, culture and history and wanted to be sure you passed that on and shared it. So I, I'm just curious if you would just to take a few minutes to talk about the role these stories play within Cherokee culture. They're so instructive and illustrative. You tell them to children early on. Is this a uh, 
is this part of what brought you back? I know Freeman, you teach, and Kathy, you are you've studied education also. Would you just talk just briefly about how you see your what brought you home to age and place and share your knowledge with others in your community? You know, Alan, I will start out first. All Cherry Keys, and I would say this without uh, many exceptions, all Cherry Keys are drawn back home to the land where they came from, even after the Trail of Tears in 1838. We've had many people who were sent to a new home in Oklahoma, the Cherokee Nation and the United Ketua Band. But even those people love to have the opportunity to come back to the land where the Great Spirit put them down in the beginning. So it's very important to realize the importance of place. And this includes all the place, all of the environment, all of the biomes, all of the things that are around us. The beautiful swimming holes in the old Konolufti River, the Tukasiji, the, um, the animals and the birds and even the trees and the plants, like many people from the Cherokee reservations would return looking for the ramp patches, which is a wonderful uh, plant that used for food amongst the uh, Tolagin. And so once you are born being Cherokee, then you are a part of this land forever. You're a part of the family of the animals, the families of fishes, the families of birds and all that is. And I think that a lot of the Cherokee people are uh, prone to get up early in the morning. As we get older, they it seems like the more early we always get up, um, but go outside just as the sun is coming up over the ridges and listening to the birds sing that beautifully morning song, the welcoming song of the beginning of a new day. This is a very, very important thing. And not only that, but to be able to go and to sit down in a chair in the evening when the birds are singing and giving a thankful song and bird calls at night and watching the sun go down. Because we do believe that that sunset is not the end, but it is the beginning of the new day. So all cherry keys who go away will return home someday. So I had to come back and to be able to share some of the things I'd learned by traveling around the earth and um, share them with the children who need to learn those things sometimes and as often as possible from their own people. And that's my biggest pride in being a teacher is being able to say that I'm one of the ones that I'm teaching. That's great. Uh, and it appeals to us with AARP, which is a volunteer driven organization. And many of us at this point in our lives feel that same compulsion to want to come home and share lessons with uh, the community around us, especially the younger ones. And I must say, I'm proud of my mountain heritage and feel it every day, but I still don't have a taste for ramps yet. Oh, you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> you scramble them. When I was much younger, I thought that living here was so boring. And I thought that surely, um, if I go to the city, if I go, if I go to somewhere far away, that I would have a much more enriching life. I, I uh, so I did that, and I found that um, it was super expensive and concrete everywhere. Uh, people were nice, and I started missing the mountains. I started missing. Um, tribal traditions and like Freeman was saying certain foods and my family and I thought that I would go to the big city and from there I could travel less expensively like to Hawaii or Canada or Alaska and then whenever I was able to the only place that I went was back home and then I I didn't want 
to leave once I got there, but I felt like I had a really good job. It was with a school district, and I really enjoyed the people, the work that I was doing, but I just missed home so much. And once I started telling stories, I felt like going home and sharing those stories and performing the stories would be a really good resource for the tribe because because it was just beginning to be the electronic era, I guess, um, era. And I just thought that children, well, all of us, we need to use our imaginations. I know that there's an expression now, we need to unplug and disconnect. And I I felt like I could do that. And I uh, then I found that so many of the stories were not being used. Um, some of them knew, some of them, but a good many of us and our younger people didn't know them. So I began trying to perform and I always like to perform for libraries and schools and there's uh, never a charge for that because I felt like their budget is always sh strapped. And I, enjoy doing that so much and there's such few younger people um, starting to do storytelling. So I've opened up a, a storytelling school so to speak and before COVID met with a few young people and we would go to historic and culturally significant places and then if there's any stories associated with those places then I would teach them that. And we covered a number of other things too. Um, and then of course COVID hit and we haven't been able to meet, but I'm still in touch with them and I enjoy that a lot. Um, I've also explored a way to where people can watch videos and if there's any stories associated with those places, then I, I tell those on YouTube. And again, free of charge, um, it's just a way of uh, giving back and hopefully there'll be younger people that are learning um, and can think of other ways to share the stories and put them in the schools and in the classrooms. I know um, a young teacher had a great idea that one of our scary stories, supernatural creature by the name of Spearfinger, and she thought and is writing a play so that children will perform and then she has a way of like a red laser <laughs> coming coming in there with special effects and I just thought that was exciting. So I'm glad to move home and be home and I never want to leave and I feel like my biggest responsibility is to be a tribal resource um, as as I age and share with with anyone who wants to know and can incorporate the story so that the stories will live on. That's so beautiful. I, you know, there's an old mm -hmm. adage about growing where you're planted. And I think all right. of us as we age are, are aging where we're planted. And, you know, sometimes maybe getting out into the world is what it takes to appreciate right. what we've learned and what we know and I admire you you represent that AARP spirit of volunteering time back in the community to share that knowledge. Um, I think Rebecca, our little uh, wonder person, our mountain uh, associate state director, has a question that uh, uh, she wanted to post and uh, I think she's putting that up. <clears throat> and uh, if you can see that, would you uh, want to comment on the fact that, you know, many of us in the mountain region perhaps forget that as Gretchen notes that she stops and realizes that she lives on Cherokee land and feels a special respect and connection for that reason. Yep, I would like to comment on that, please, if you don't mind. Um, in the early times when Cherokees had their complete amount of land, we lived in parts of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia. We possessed as many as 240,000 square miles of territory. 
And eventually we would lose all of that, uh, not because of warfare, but just because of mostly deceit and uh, putting it in a nice way. And um, this land was taken care of for 15,000 years by the native people. And a lot of times we um, move out and we go to different places and realize we have not even left the old Cherokee homeland yet. And so it's, it's a good thing to know that people are realizing that there's more to history than the 200 and some years that the United States has been here, that there are those 56,000 years that we cared for the land, even to the point of staying on one village site for thousands of years. And when the settlers began to come in, they would uh, completely delete the value of the land in 15 or 20 years by not being able to know how to rotate crops and to plant and to fertilize naturally. And so it's good that people realize that, yes, this was Cherokee land. And we would hope that we begin to realize that this needs to be taken care of still today. We have the elk running all around in the Smokies. We have the wild turkey almost everywhere you want to go through the mountains. And um, it's a very beautiful thing to see that people do not feel like they have to kill or destroy everything to be able to enjoy life and place scheme. Thank you. That was beautiful. Kathy? I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can add anything to that. That was wonderful. Um, I appreciate uh, Gretchen's comment and, and the, and the feeling that she gets. And there are, there are over 565 federally recognized tribes in this country. And I heard a park ranger say one time that every national park was once someone's home. And that really sticks with me. Of course, Freeman and I, and those of people who visit here and live close to here, feel close to our mountains and our, and our rivers and our wildlife. But I think that's true for everywhere. Um, and I, I think having respect for one another and where they come from is key to everything staying in harmony. Well, both of you have been quite eloquent on that uh, and appreciate that insight. There's much to learn beyond this. And as we talked before, I hope that today will just be the beginning of some more opportunities to share with you. Well, if it's okay, Freeman, uh, does anything in there inspire you to tee up another story? Yeah, I'd love to tell another story. So often there's questions, how are you going to quieten me down to get me to stop? But I like <laughs> to tell you a, a story of... Um, Stickball, I think it'd be a very fitting thing. You know that uh, Cherokee stickball came from lacrosse, or lacrosse came from Cherokee stickball. And the Cherokee uh, ball game was invented by the women. And many times uh, we use stories about animals to uh, teach people because we didn't want to insult or to uh, make someone mad at us. And so we would tell them stories about animals. So in the early times that there was such a terrible turmoil going on in the forest and it was the birds and the animals that were arguing and fighting and carrying on and so eventually the uh, Cherokee women who were owned all of the land and they owned the children in the old days and um, they finally told the birds and the animals to choose their stickball team um, and get ready to play and the stickball is one of the roughest games I, as far as I'm concerned in the world use a hickory stick made with a net in the end of it and you pick up the ball in the net and once you get it above your knees you can take it out and you better run for dear life because the people on the opposing team can use that stick to slow you down a little bit they can choke you with it they can bop you upside the head with it and um, so it is a rough and tumble game and so the animals and birds began to choose their teams and the bear was choosing first and this is a story of inclusiveness and the old bear began to choose the mountain lions and the bobcat and the huge deer because we had the antlers and even down to the skunk who had the chemical warfare possibilities <laughs> and to the chipmunks and the rabbits and the possums and all of the animals that you can think of. 
And he looked around in the old Yona, which is the Cherokee word for bear is Yona. And so Yona had chosen um, all these animals. He said, I'm ready to play. This is my team. When all of a sudden there was a little mouse, uh, G staging, who came uh, rushing through the leaves with all of his might to get there. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm late. I'm ready to play for the birds. Would you please uh, let me play? And the old bear looked down in him. And um, I want you to think about the difference in the vision of a bear and the vision of an eagle. An eagle can spot a squirrel on another mountainside in a tree, whereas a bear can just barely see from tree to tree. And so the old bear had chosen. And he looked at the little mouse and he said, I don't want you on my team, you little runt. Go away. So the mouse was hurt greatly. And so we as human beings must take things that, from the animals at times and from these old stories and learn from them. And so the little mouse went looking for the awohali. The awohali is the eagle in his great vision. And he went up to him and he said, Mr. Eagle, can I play for your team? The bear has hurt me and he doesn't want me and I don't know what to do. I want to play. And the eagle said, sure, you can play. Then he asked him something that sort of melded the little mouse's heart. He says, can you fly? And the mouse started walking away, and the old eagle looked at him, and he said, where are you going, little mouse? He says, I don't even have wings. How can I fly? But the eagle in his great vision said, well, we can make you some wings. So they took some sycamore bark that was wet and it was pliable, and so the woodpecker made holes all around it. They sewed it behind the front legs of the little mouse, and they threw him up in the air, and he began to fly. And by the time morning came, he was like he was dancing on the wind. He could fly so well. So we went out in the field, and they threw the ball up in the middle of the field, and you're supposed to jump with your sticks, the two leaders of the teams, and knock that ball to someone who can run with it. But they jumped the ball, and... There was a brown streak and the ball disappeared. They looked down at the other end of the bird's goal post and there was a little mouse with a ball in his mouth. And in this Cherokee game, if you play and you score 12 points, you won the game. And so that little mouse scored 12 points that day and very few other creatures even touched that ball that day. And so if we look up at night, this afternoon and evening, just before dark, you will see this little creature flying around. He's really an animal that can fly. He's not like the flying squirrel who is a glider. He can glide from tree to tree, but the little mouse can really fly. And if you realize it, he is the Samaha or the bat. And so we need to make sure that we don't leave other people out. We need to make sure that we protect all living species of this earth and don't assume that we can eliminate one and it will be okay and to our great benefit. And so uh, that is a story of animals and birds, but it's a What a great story. I uh, was first exposed to lacrosse when I got to college and was totally fascinated and was trying to learn the game and play at the same time and mostly just got beat up. So <laughs> I, must have really needed a, I needed an eagle around to help me, but it's a beautiful uh, mm -hmm. uh, lesson from the story that we can all help each other uh, and be respectful that way. Kathy, I, I was going to ask uh, Rebecca to post. It was a nice comment. I thought you might appreciate before I, I let you go on to the next story. I just thought this was worth sharing with you. Oh. So you've got uh, uh, viewers oh, nice. all the way out in uh, Nevada today and missing home. Oh, yeah, especially the food. I, I can relate to that. <laughs> well, I, I do wonder, anybody on this uh, who has never had fry bread, uh, be careful if you start. It's, it's, uh, it can be addictive. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, Alan, one thing that... Um, could be done as many times when Cherokee people leave the Cherokee land, they will, when they are at home, they will pick up a stone from the river. It doesn't have to be a big stone. It can just be a tiny little one and they carry it with them. And no matter where you go, you always have part of home with you. That's beautiful. Right. Kathy, I bet you're inspired with something now. 
Oh yes, I am. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's it's pretty hard not to to it's pretty hard to listen to Freeman and not get inspired. So um, I'm going to go ahead and and share this one, and it ex it it explains um, again some of the relationships, but it also teaches a good lesson, I think. And there was once a small boy that had gone fishing. And he didn't have much luck and the sun was warm and he grew sleepy. So he fell asleep. And when he woke up, he was shocked to see that there was a giant bear at his feet. He was so scared he couldn't move. He couldn't say anything. And he was even more scared when the bear started to talk to him and said, little brother, climb on my back. There's a place I want to take you to. And his eyes got big and he shook his head, no. And the bear said, yes, no, nothing, no one is going to hurt you. This is very important. Get on my back. So the little boy did. He was too scared not to. And he hung on really tight. And the bear took off so fast that the boy's eyes shut against the wind. The bear went all around and up and down. And the boy was so scared he didn't know what was going to happen to him. When they finally stopped, the bear said, you can open your eyes now. And he opened his eyes and what he saw was so amazing that he forgot to be scared because he saw a lake, a lake that he had never heard about. And the water was so beautiful. It was so blue. It was almost purple. And as he looked over to the side, there were animals and birds lined up, even animals that normally would be trying to hurt or eat the other animals. But they were just patiently waiting. And then he noticed that they were hurt. There was a bird with a broken wing. And there was a bobcat with a really hurt paw. And one by one, they got into the lake, swam to the other side. When they got out, they were well. They were whole and, and healthy. And they ran or flew off. He's told the bear, oh, take me back home. This is wonderful. Please show me how to get here again. There, there's people back home that could really use this water. Uh, one, of, one of our men is just really hurt. His arm is broken. And my grandmother, oh, her bones hurt her so bad every day. And and her joints are so swollen. She could get in this water and, and she would be well. Please take me back. And the bear said, this is why I brought you. Because humans can't come here yet. We would like for you all to be able to use the medicine that's in this water. But... As long as humans are still fighting among each other, you can't come to the magic water, to the magic lake. But I brought you here so that you can tell people about it. And maybe one day, I hope that you can. I hope that too. And I know that all of the viewers um, here today hope that as well. Well, that's a pretty strong way to uh, finish up here and take a pause. You guys have just been remarkable. Um, we've, we've had a lot of folks on here, lots of great comments. Uh, one that we might want to revisit in the future is about uh, the language and cultural aspect. Kathy, I know you've been very involved in preserving historical sites and preserving the stories around them. But I guess uh, to wrap up, would you guys just take a moment and and reflect on how these 
particular stories and perceptions of animals have affected you in your processes individually of aging and, and wanting to be there in place as you age? I think being in Cherokee, North Carolina is part of what I was telling you a while ago that all Cherokees want to be home, especially when they begin to get older. I've seen uh, people go into the military and travel all around the world. And uh, I have seen people and talked to folks like Tingling Rogers, who died not too long ago, but he was in the Baton Death March. And um, I asked him one day, I said, Ting, how did you survive the imprisonment at Baton in World War II? And he said, you know, there was only one thing that kept me alive. He said, I wanted to fish in the O'Connor Lefty River once more. And he said, that's what kept me alive to be able to make it back home to Cherokee, North Carolina. And so it's very important to be in a society who respect the elders and the older you get, the more respect you receive. And in our dominant society today, the older you get, it seems like even your insurances and different people want to write you off and uh, not spend um, certain amounts of money on you because your life is not worth saving at that point. But the Cherokee people believe that the wisdom, the old body may be old, but the wisdom is worth saving. And if we need to save that wisdom, just like the language, the more of the elders that die, the more we lose in the language. But we're trying to keep that going and renew it by the new, new Katua Academy where the children are taught. And there are people there, the Cherokee people who are teaching very hard and as quickly as they can and as much as they can to preserve this language that was beaten out of them. And during boarding school, and if you don't know what boarding school is, look it up on the computer or Native American boarding schools, and you'll find that the United States, States policy at that time was to uh, kill the Indianness and save the man or the child. And this was practiced for over 100 years. So we're trying to come back from this great devastating approach of the government. And now they say it's okay to be Native American. I think it's because they took us out from under the War Department and said, well, it's, you can be Americans now. It's okay. So think about that. Kathy, any thoughts you'd like to share on that? Uh, just how, again, how this has all affected the perceptions. I do think Freeman touched on a, a different cultural appreciation for elders and folks as they age. Do you, you feel like that's been true for you? Yes, I do. Um, I agree with Freeman that it wasn't always like this, but I'm excited to see where our, even our buildings now are being thoughtfully, um, decorated. We are fortunate that we have a new hospital facility and it was really exciting to me that they ask young people, young at the high school, um, what stories, what Cherokee stories did they want to see in the hospital, in the decorations? And as you walk in, you look down and you can, you see fish sw uh, swimming along in the stream as you walk and you see uh, footprints of animals. And then the story that Freeman told about the how Grandmother Spider brought the fire, uh, she's like in this big atrium and near the staircase. And you can look down and you can see the fire and you can see Grandmother Spider. So I think it's wonderful that our young people are paying attention and asking questions and learning and, and saying, we don't want it to be this way anymore. We, we're proud of who we are. And it's nice that that we're still here, that they can ask us. And it's exciting when they do. And then they take that and they put it into an idea 
or a design or an art piece or a story. And it's it's really exciting to see that the stories are alive. Well, that's just great. I mean, you guys have just been amazing and I do appreciate your commitment to, in Freeman's words, save the wisdom. Um, I think sometimes we still struggle in many societies to respect what's been learned by others. As one hard-headed young man, I didn't want to listen to my elders. I had to find out for myself. Could have probably saved myself a lot of headaches. Might not have been as well, but but I now <laughs> appreciate uh, much of what was taught. And you've made me want to. I used to fish the O'Connell Lefty with my grandfather, Ravensport. Yeah. Maybe want to come back and do it again sometime soon. Yeah, the fish are still there waiting for you. Hey, you guys have right. got them loaded. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been a delightful program. I, on behalf of our viewers, uh, I want to thank you again. It's been a delight to get to uh, know you and spend time with you both before and today. And I want to remind our viewers that we'll be back same time next Thursday at noon with the next part of our series as we continue to explore animal-human relations. And just one little uh, formality, we really would like... If for our viewers to take a survey and provide us with feedback uh, on this session. As I said, we, we want to be able to go forward with this. If you uh, register through AARP, you'll get a link. Uh, you'll receive that, that you'll get in your email soon after the session ends. But if you are still on Facebook or YouTube, but have not registered, but joined later, then just please uh, uh, make any comments, observations you'd like to share with us, suggestions in the comments section. And uh, thank you again uh, so much for your time today, Freeman and Kathy. Uh, we, uh, before we close though, we also want to recognize one of our other partners in this series has been Appalachian State University. And I want to uh, welcome Kelly Williams. Welcome. And uh, Kelly Thanks. is an associate professor in the Department of Social Work at ASU. Uh, she's former uh, medical social worker at UNC Healthcare and is now back to teaching both at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Her uh, teaching areas include social work practice in healthcare, social uh, environments, and so forth. And she's doing a lot of uh, research now currently into marginalized and underserved populations, uh, including the uninsured, which is certainly vital to all of us uh, AARP folks. And she's an animal lover, too, as an aside with her. Uh, or schnauzer mix. So Kelly, uh, we're glad to have you as a partner. And would you just take a few minutes before we close to share the study that you folks are undertaking? Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Alan. Um, yes, thank you. It's, it's such an honor to be part of this AARP virtual series on the power of human animal relationships. And I would just like to thank um, Freeman and Kathy um, for such a, a truly beautiful sharing of um, Cherokee stories of creation and how animals can teach us um, so many important life lessons. Um, so I wanted to honor, take a moment to honor, honor uh, Freeman and Kathy. Um, and I would just like to make um, two brief announcements. Um, first, uh, Maureen McNamara, Emily Dakin, and myself, we are uh, social work professors at the department, in the Department of Social Work at Appalachian State University. And we will be um, facilitating the, the final program in this AARP virtual series on the power of human animal relationships on July 1st. Um, this is gonna be a Zoom program and it will be a, an open conversation on aging in place with pets. And we invite people to include their pets in this um, Zoom session. Um, and we'll be uh, just having an open conversation um, and perhaps exploring some um, issues such as uh, financial and physical challenges to keeping pets as well as considerations for caring for aging pets. Uh, and so we hope to see many of you there on July 1st. 
And um, second, I just wanted to mention that there um, is going to be an opportunity that uh, to participate this fall in a upcoming research project facilitated by the um, Maureen, Emily, and myself from Appalachian State University. And the aim of this project is to develop a pilot and pilot a survey about pets and people in rural communities. Um, and we wanted to hear from people who have pets and people who do not have pets. In addition, we would love to hear from people who have pets that many of us think of as farm animals or live livestock. Um, so in the comment section of today's live stream event, you'll find a URL link to a study interest form. And on this form, uh, you may provide your email address so that we can send you more information about the research project. And this would be in late se September, or early October. And at that time, you can decide whether or not you would like to participate in an online survey. Um, this is an Appalachian State University study and not an AARP study. Um, your email address would only be seen by the research team, Maureen, Emily, and myself. And uh, we will only use your email address to send you the study information in late September or early October. Um, we will not share your email address with anyone outside of our research team. So thank you in advance for um, your consideration and interest in this project. Um, Thanks, Kelly. Uh, thank we're, we're glad to have you as a partner. I'm hoping that today uh, Likewise. we will be uh, building on our relationship with Appalachian State University. And I want to thank Kathy and Freeman again. It's been great to make new friends and have you with us. I, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. And that, uh, as they oh, say, the Casablanca, I hope this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship that we will take forward <laughs> and explore other uh, opportunities going forward. So a quick reminder to our viewers, uh, again, next Thursday, we'll be back uh, live again at noon on Thursday. And uh, thanks for joining us today. And thank you to our guests.